Welcome to Tips and Tricks for Defending the Enterprise Using Open Source Tools. Uh, hopefully everyone can see our slides uh, and hear my voice. Um, this webcast is sponsored by Logrhythm. Uh, I'd like to welcome Steve Kaufman, their Technical Product Manager. Steve, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So I'm going to start this off, John, if you can switch to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to kick this off and talk about this basic presentation I've trimmed down that I gave at InfoSec World uh, earlier in the year. And uh, this is only the second time uh, I've presented this one. And it's all about how you use the open source tools effectively in your enterprise. And uh, that's the agenda that's up there now. It's basically I'm going to start talking about how, why we should be using open source, why we should even be talking about using open source in the enterprise. Um, kind of like how we got from open source being this kind of weird thing that if you talked about at your work, people kind of looked at you funny to being like fully supported in our industry today. Um, I'll talk about mostly how my open source deployments have gone throughout my career, uh, which are kind of interesting. Then we'll talk about why you should not use open source, why you should use open source in the enterprise in a few examples. Uh, and as I go through the examples, I'm going to then transition over to Steve, who's going to talk about uh, using Kibana specifically as an open source tool in your enterprise and how Kibana is uh, integrated with other tools, logarithms included, and how you can have your experts in your organization uh, using Kibana as an extra free open source interface to do some analysis. So next slide. Um, so next slide, this is why we should be talking about open source software. You can jump ahead, John. Um, so my own experience is how we started with, um, you know, open source tools. In the, in the late 90s, um, we didn't really learn Linux in a lot of degree programs. Um, my day job at the time didn't want to run any software without commercial support. When I would put Linux on a system, people would be like, oh, you know, that's cute. It's kind of like a serving suggestion, right? Um, then when I started as a sysadmin in the university, uh, we primarily ran Solaris as our operating system. And when I'd bring up Linux, basically people would laugh at me. Um, by the time I had left the university in 2006, 2007 timeframe, they had fully converted to open source Red Hat Linux Enterprise uh, and were phasing out Solaris. And in 2007, where I landed my job at Ocean, I was using entirely open source software deploying to many of the universities and nonprofits in Rhode Island. And I was basically deploying snort sensors using all open source software to help them monitor their uh, infrastructure and their security events. So just that progression in you know, that 10 year span was amazing for me in my own career to experience Linux being this cute thing that everyone laughed at open source all the way to in 2007, really having major support in the projects that I was working on. Next slide. I, and I think one of the other uh, progressions that we've seen in open source, next slide, John, um, is we, it started with some really smart person, right? And that's how many of these open source projects started were gaining support from, uh, you know, people like Fyodor in creating the Nmap project, people like HD Moore in creating, John, can you switch to the next slide? And, uh, you know, Mutz, who created Kali Linux, and Marty Resch, who created Snort. It was these really intelligent and outgoing individuals that started these open source projects that was some of the first software we've adopted. And in the next slide, you'll see that when we fast forward to today, that it's not only just some smart person that's supporting these open source projects, it's major corporations like Netflix, it's the National Security Agency, uh, it's companies like Uber, whose GitHub repository is huge. So now we see major organizations um, like Facebook as well, supporting open source software, create, having their employees create open source software and being fully supported by an organization. So next slide. So then it comes down to like, well, maybe we should all be using open source. Um, but you know, here's how most open source projects go. Uh, it's not all rainbows and unicorns <laughs> when you implement open source software. Um, so if you switch to the next slide, um, the evolution of open source projects, right? This is typically, in my experience, how an open source project is implemented. Um, and on the left, you can see 
that it ranges from me wanting to shove a fork in my eye all the way up to me wanting to hug Tux, right? That's the, the first axis on the, uh, axis on the left. And then as time goes on, on the bottom, uh, is how this graph is laid out. So, you know, typically when I start, I want to stick a fork in my eye because I've been burned by something, right? I've got some major challenge, some security incident that happened. My management's asked me, hey, how come we didn't have visibility into that? And I'm like, well, I, one of the problems is I didn't have the right tools, right? So I started off being burned. Then I start going out and finding open source software and I start compiling it and I run into dependency issues. And then I want to hug Tux because, well, it compiled. So I, my, my mood has gone up to all the way almost to hugging Tux, right? Then I run into some more dependency problems. Then I get it to run and I want to hug Tux again. Then I, I run out of disk space because maybe it's a log collection engine and I'm back down to wanting to stick a fork in my eye. And then I get solve that problem and it works again. So I'm back to hugging Tux. And then I do an app get disk upgrade and it fails and I'm back to sticking forks in my eye. And then I file a bug report because I found some kind of problem. So I'm somewhere in between wanting to stick a fork in my eye and hugging Tux. Um, then I realize there's a missing feature. And so I have to adopt the experimental version. And then when I do that, I show it to my coworkers and I'm back to hugging Tux because they all think it's awesome until we find another bug uh, and, and then I'm back to sticking a fork in my eye and then management starts talking about it as how I'm able to solve problems. And so, you know, my, my mood is back up towards wanting to hug Tux again. And this is typically the roller coaster that I've gone through and I'm sure many of you have gone through as well that speaks to the evolution of open source projects. So if we switch to the next slide, um, again, I think this journey typically starts out with you know, getting burned in a meeting, like, and your management wants to know, well, how big is the problem? And I need tools and resources to tell me how many systems are compromised, how do they become compromised? I don't have time to go implement commercial software. I need some open source software to do that. So if you go to the next slide, um, in your search for open source software, um, you may have found a couple of commercial versions that help. Um, you read the vendor websites, you're really confused and you're like, I don't have time to implement commercial software, so I'm gonna to go to open source. And in the next slide, to find the right open source software, you may turn to social media. Now, the best, you know, not the best answer, but the most popular answer you're gonna get is, well, to solve your problem, you need to use Python. And I'm like, okay, I understand it's a language and it's very powerful, but it's not a full solution. And also asking social media for the best open source project isn't always the right thing to do. So in the next slide, you've actually found some open source software. You've got it downloaded and installed, and you're really excited, right? And then in the next slide, right at the end of your lengthy install process of this open source software, you get an error and it crashes, right? Either the software doesn't run because it's segmentation faults, um, or you realize that once you've got it running, you need an experimental version or some different branch of that open source software. So you basically have to throw everything in the dumpster and start over. In the next slide, um, you're installing what you think is the right software and you're having issues again. You're trying different suggestions. You're copying and pasting from Stack Overflow and other websites. You're reading discussion forums and you're pretty frustrated and you're at the stick of fork in my eye. Then in the next slide, you finally get it running. And this was my experience, right? And you run out of disk space. And you realize that your VM will just never have enough space because you're trying to implement some log collection, for example, an analysis tool. And you tried to do it in the VM to save time. And now that, that's all gone as well. Um, and so in the next slide, I think that this, I relate this to a couple of different sci-fi shows. And in these sci-fi shows, they have the concept, if you've watched Star Trek Discovery or you've seen the show Dark Matter, right? They've got in Discovery what they call a spore drive and in Dark Matter what they call a blink drive, which essentially lets you travel through space and time really, really fast using some really new, brand new technology. It goes beyond warp drive. It just lets you, in the blink of an eye, appear in a completely different universe millions of light years away without having to travel at warp speed. Now, it's really cool. However, if you watch both of those shows, the issues that they encounter with this new technology causes huge issues for them. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I feel like that's the same thing for open source software, especially given my experiences having implemented open source software in the past. That's what I feel like is a really good analogy. 
So in the next slide, um, you know, you finally get it working and you show your coworkers and, you know, maybe it crashes and you're kind of back to square one. So maintaining open source software is difficult. So in the next slide, um, this is kind of an introduction as to why we don't want to use open source tools. Um, and, and when it does crash, it's, it's not your segmentation fault. I'm sure that was pretty funny. Um, so why don't we want to use open source tools? And I think the most common uh, objection to open source tools is, well, there's no support. Like if something goes wrong, we can't call someone and get support. But I think many of us know that it's not about actually getting support, that the argument over, over time has been, we've got no one else to blame. And I, of course, I think that's a really, you know, kind of lame excuse. I think we want to fix problems, not place blame on people. Um, and I think many of us have encountered uh, support from commercially offered services and software that is not up to par. And support, as many of us listening can attest to, uh, the mileage varies. So I, I don't think support is necessarily like the highest priority thing when you're implementing software for those reasons, but it's often an argument we'll hear as to why you shouldn't use open source tools. Um, so on the next slide, and this is really more of an issue for me, not so much support, um, this bug fixes and new features is really a huge driver for me when I recommend people don't use open source software. And that's because when you look at commercial software, you typically have a product manager. And that product manager's job is to gather requirements from customers and explain to the developers and uh, develop requirements for developers to implement features in the software that meet customer requirements. Now, there's also uh, lesser known uh, role in product management that is preserving existing features and compatibility. And that's something that the product management is working on, recognizing what features are in use by their existing customers. And as development moves forward, making sure they're preserving backwards compatibility so they're not breaking stuff. So as you upgrade commercial software, theoretically, and I know this doesn't happen all the time, but theoretically, you will um, find that you will be more compatible with your existing integrations and uh, features that you use in commercial software. When it comes to open source tools, the features that you get are random and not guaranteed. The open source developer may decide that, hey, in my next version, I'm just going to completely rewrite everything. Or I'm going to take this module and completely rewrite it, and now it's not backwards compatible or your, a feature you were using isn't there anymore because the open source author was like, well, I don't feel like maintaining that feature anymore, so I'm just going to rip it out because it's too much work to maintain. So that's one of the dangers of using open source software. Uh, in the next slide is kind of the evolution of that is the developers not just making decisions on features. They're calling into question their entire um, support for this project. So basically... Projects can be ephemeral. I mean, I've used open source software in the past and all of a sudden the developer goes, yeah, I'm, I'm done. Like I've moved on to other projects and either takes down the source code or um, <clears throat> just stops updating it, right? And sometimes you may even get a good notification that they've stopped updating the software. Um, it could go away uh, entirely like Lima Charlie is a project that, and this has happened in the past. You know, I, I worked at Tenable when just after they had made the decision to not continue the open source version. Of course, that was forked into open VAS. Um, other projects such as Lima Charlie basically said, we're no longer operating this open source tool. It's now a commercial tool. So you run the risk that software you're relying on could just completely go away. In the next slide, we've talked about the time and effort it takes to maintain open source solutions and some of the challenges that you run into, and that can factor into it. Typically, implementing open source software takes a lot more time. The next slide talks about the security. Open source software may not be as secure because so many people are contributing and there's no commercial entity's bottom line at stake. And we've seen these issues with many open source projects, OpenSSL being the most glaring one. And I think the tendency is for people to think, well, there's a lot of eyes on the problem or on the software, so therefore it should be more secure. However, having the right eyes on it and being held to a bottom line where there's an entire company built around a software product that their business is built around it, tend to work harder to preserve the integrity of that software and discover and respond to bugs. Now, there's a lot of different sides to this argument, right? 
I think a lot of open source tools are very good at fixing bugs once they're identified, maybe even more so than commercial products. Um, but I think that one of the reasons that you should caution yourself to including a lot of open source components is what is the actual security of it? When is the last time that they've done a security audit? Heartbleed was instrumental in changing the face of open source to combat this problem because they realized that no one was really looking at security and it was underfunded and under-resourced to be able to maintain the security of that software. So in the next slide, we're going to transition into why we do want to use open source tools, right? So the first thing on the next slide is, um, well, the price, they're free, right? I don't have to go get budget approval to go download some open source software, stick it in a VM on my machine, or maybe get some old hardware and implement it. My cost is essentially free. Now, you have to factor in your time. We've already established that it can take some more time to you know, build those uh, components yourself and implement open source software. Um, but I think having that be free is a huge driver, probably the primary driver for implementing open source. The next uh, slide talks about saving time. And I think this is really a developer kind of thing, right? Where developers charged with a problem and they're like, you need to have these requirements and you need to solve this problem. And the developer says, oh, wow, there's already, already an open source library or open source tool that does this. I can just incorporate it into my code or into my project and I've solved that problem. And it saved me a whole bunch of time because I don't have to go find or build that solution rather myself. It's kind of like, uh, I think it was Mike Poor that said, you know, if you click your heels three times uh, and envision a software project that solves your problem, you can do a Google search and, and find it pretty quickly. Uh, the next slide talks about prototyping. And I think this is super important for those working in the enterprise. You might be pitching an idea, a solution to a problem, and you can't get budget approval. People are skeptical. And they're like, I don't think this is the right approach. I don't think we need a tool that does this. You can go find something that's open source and you can prototype it. And then you can show your coworkers, you can show management, hey, I did, you know, I got this open source thing. Look at the problems I'm solving with it. And by the way, I've got these limitations and there's these other commercial offerings maybe that you're going to move to. Um, but open source provided you that prototype to show people that you can solve a problem in a certain way. On the next slide, it talks about customization. And this is a great reason to adopt open source because you can customize it and tweak it to your environment. You can extend the software. You can find different components to integrate that software, um, provided the license. You got to read your licenses. Uh, you know, if you're a commercial entity adopting open source and you're making modifications, you know, some of those licenses make you contribute that back out. So you have to make sure you read your licenses. But having that customization um, and extensibility of open source is a huge driver to use it in the enterprise. The last one is, uh, you know, we covered security already, right? This can go in either direction. Um, so maybe we do want to use open source because, well, first, we can look at all the code and determine if it's secure. Now, that can also be debated. I mean, it's really hard to discover bugs inside of code, you know, versus maybe fuzzing them or testing them in a different way. But I think um, certainly after Heartbleed, a lot of the security uh, of open source projects is getting better. Um, it, you know, the DOD has uh, pledged a huge support for open source projects. Um, Apache Struts still, uh, you know, of course has, has issues as well. But as these issues are discovered, Struts is an example, we're starting now to uncover a lot more bugs and getting those fixed. So I do think there's some merit to open source software, excuse me, being more secure. I do find that the, once a bug is identified, it's tend to be fixed very, very quickly, often quicker than some commercial entities. So on the next slide, we're going to talk about good examples of open source software in the enterprise, specifically focused on defense. There's a lot of a penetration testing and attack tools that we've talked about since the start of our program 14 years ago. Um, but I wanted to focus on defense uh, in this one. And my next slide is my first tool um, that I really like and probably my number one pick that I've found extremely useful in my own experiences, and I found a really great adoption by enterprises. When I meet with enterprises and I ask them about what they're using for network monitoring, many are talking about Bro IDS and specifically implementing that on the security onion. This was created by Doug Burks in 2008. It's an awesome, awesome project that basically has everything pre-configured, 
So one of the benefits and the reasons I like Security Onion is because those challenges and struggles I talked about earlier are almost non-existent when you get the Security Onion because you can drop that VM in and Doug and his team have already pre-compiled and configured everything for you, saving you a bunch of time, which is great. Um, Security Onion is now owned in, in dedicated training and services company. It had over 200,000 downloads as of 2015. Having a strong community around it is also a big plus in my mind for open source projects. Uh, on the next slide is some of the um, <coughs> components that are included with Security Onion. You get the Bro IDS. You get Snort with Squeal and Squirt, Squirt and Suricata. And all of these are configured to run in this platform. Anyone over the past, you know, five or 10 years that's tried to compile Snort on their own knows it can be pretty challenging, right? Sometimes it feels like it's impossible to get it running. Um, whereas here you've got it already pre-compiled uh, and integrated into the security onion. It also, and Steve's gonna talk later about the full Elk stack. Um, that's the Elastic stack, Logstash and Kibana. Steve will expand upon that later. That's included with the security onion. As well as it also incorporates um, the OSEC host IDS, right? Um, so OSEC is a, an uh, integrated uh, open source agent that <clears throat> can talk to Security Onion. There's lots of really cool projects that you can do with that as well. On the next slide is some of the uh, screenshots. Um, at the time I did this presentation, it was in the experimental phases. I believe all of these changes in the full Elk stack and Kibana are integrated into the latest uh, stable version of Security Onion. And Steve will talk about some more examples of this, but I love Kibana. I love the interface. I love the analytics tool. I love the uh, visibility it gives me. You can see here this donut chart are connections that are outbound in my network. This was really easy for me to implement. I uh, gave it a mirror of our traffic here at Security Weekly. And uh, you know, in the next couple of hours, it was collecting traffic. And I knew all I could see a donut graph of all of the ports that were connecting. Um, and I know it's hard to see you know, on your screen, but um, basically that donut chart is, you know, saying 443 was the top port and then 53 and then some other ports as well, giving me instant visibility into what traffic and connections were leaving my network. Um, and, you know, as I said, Steve will go into some of the more of the analytics you can do with the Kibana interface. And the next slide um, is a, a big summary, a larger summary of all the different protocols that were in use on my network. Um, next slide. Some of the analytics that I did, as I dug into all of the tools on Security Onion, I found an alert because Snort had um, some threat intelligence feeds that are integrated open source threat intelligence feeds that told me there was a host on my network that had, was connecting to an IP address on the internet that had a poor reputation that was known to be a bad IP address on an open source threat intelligence list, which is typically an indication that that host on my network is compromised. What it turned out to be was one of our Skype devices. This is actually a commercial Skype device that we use here that was making connections uh, for Skype, which connects to all kinds of random hosts on the internet to proxy those Skype connections. It happened to hit an IP address on the list. So it turned out to be not a big deal, but shows you kind of the power of all of those tools that are incorporated um, with Security Onion. Next slide. Um, so as many of you know, John Strand and I, and, and now Chris Brenton also um, run a company called Active Countermeasures. One of the things we decided to do early on was to release a free and open source version of our threat analytics tool, uh, which we call Rita. And that's a completely free tool. And basically what it does is it collects all of your bro logs. So you have to have bro running. It'll import all of your bro logs and it'll do all the analysis for you to tell you about connections that are suspicious for a backdoor or um, some kind of malware that's phoning home, right? Um, and it uses all kinds of fancy analytics and math and uh, things like that to do it, but it basically looks at your connection intervals, your packet size, connection time, and connection length, um, along with some other indicators as well, like was the IP address I connected to on a threat list? And it gives you a graph and basically says, with the highest degree of confidence, the first one on your list is likely what we call a beacon detection or some type of malware or payload that was trying to phone home. That traffic is, when you apply all those analytics to them, very easy to pick out of all your connections, right? It could be that one host on your network was responsible for 80% of your DNS traffic, 
likely means you have a payload on your network that they're using some kind of DNS tunneling software. So this uh, tool is completely free. You can get it on GitHub. Um, <clears throat> and it works uh, with Security Onion. I believe they've got that integration uh, now in the latest stable version. So uh, Rita will run on Security Onion, so you can blend the two together. On uh, the next slide, there's a lot of other similar projects uh, out there to Security Onion and Rita. Greylog has an open source um, uh, collection tool for log analysis. Um, my friends over at Gravwell, they also have an uh, open source version now of their analytics platform for analyzing logs uh, and indicators uh, and events in your network. Rock NSM is another one um, that was designed by the Missouri National Guard cyber team that they release as open source as well. OS SIM is Alien Vault's uh, open source SIM. So you can find similar projects out there um, that'll give you visibility into your logs, saving you a lot of work if you don't have a SIM, let's say, or you just want to do some analytics on your own, that your SIM you feel like is not the best tool for that. On the next slide, attack simulation is huge, right? MITRE releases attack framework, and so many organizations are releasing open source projects that allow you to simulate attackers in your network and simulate those attacks. So if you're sitting there wondering, I've got 30 security products on my network, what would happen if I attacked my network in these different ways that are defined by the MITRE ATT&CK uh, framework that you can then implement and simulate with Caldera, uh, Meta from Chris Gates, Atomic Red Team, and there's several others now today that allow you to basically simulate those attacks. Um, then you can say across my 30 security products, did I detect that attack? And what a lot of people are finding is they've got tools in, in their arsenal that have no capability of detecting these attacks. And they're recognizing some pretty big gaps in their security programs. And you can do all of this using the open source framework released by MITRE along with open source projects that are the implementation of, you know, here's how this particular attack works. Then you get basically like a Python script that emulates that attack and you can deploy that safely into your network. And it'll tell you if your endpoint um, protection platform can actually detect that level of attack. Now, there's commercial vendors that offer this service, uh, which, you know, if you listen to Enterprise Security Weekly, we talk about the differences between them. But you can definitely start doing some of this analysis today with open source tools, which is really awesome. And the next slide, uh, DNS blacklisting is really cool. Uh, this was a project I found called PyHole, which is designed to go on a Raspberry Pi. But you can take this open source software and put it on any Linux host, right? Um, I deployed mine up into the cloud. And basically what it does is it automates the installation and configuration of a DNS server. And it integrates with open source blacklists uh, on the internet. You get to pick which ones that you can use. And you can pick from lists that are detecting uh, malware, malicious domains that are known to distribute malware. You can also pick from lists that are known to be associated with advertising. What I found interesting when I did this project was that if I take the lists that are looking for malicious domains and I take the lists that are looking for uh, ad domains, that there's overlap between them, which was kind of scary for me. But you can implement this all using open source tools. You can deploy it to the cloud. Um, I did a technical segment on it. Um, we also, uh, Joff Fire actually extended this because when you if someone visits a malicious domain, let's say, they will get, uh, that name will typically resolve to like local host. Uh, so 127.0.0.1. What Joff did was build a system that says, anytime someone goes to a blacklisted domain, it actually redirects them to a server that collects their traffic for analysis. Um, so we've done technical segments on that. And Joff's project called Tachyon Net um, is available in open source, which is essentially collecting what that bad traffic is for analysis. VFeed is another um, free open source uh, project, and it basically gives you a lot of metadata about a particular vulnerability. So what's the severity of that vulnerability? Was it in Debian, and did Debian release something? Was there an exploit for it? Um, essentially, if you download VFeed, you can integrate that into your other open source, perhaps solutions, um, to tell you information about a vulnerability. Let's say you're vulnerability scanning or 
uh, you've discovered a vulnerability and it's got a CVE, you can pull all of the data about that CVE, what exploits it has, is it in Metasploit, is it in Saint, um, all of, you know, what platforms is it on, is the exploit public, all of that metadata, sorry, this is on the next slide, all of that metadata gets pulled down uh, in vFeed and you can use this to cross-reference with your other tools and that's completely free. On the next slide, um, there's two projects here. Facebook has an open source project called OS Query. Basically allows you to ask questions of your operating systems. Collide Fleet is the open source management platform for OS Query. Really, really cool stuff. Um, El Jefe is very similar to that. It's an open source Windows-based uh, process monitoring. It was originally developed by ImmunitySec. They're now owned by uh, Sixterra. Uh, Dave Itell, which many may recognize, um, was one of the developers and, and leaders of that project. And that's also uh, completely free. The other thing that I was playing with was using the OSSEC uh, agent with Security Onion to do some monitoring as well. And that's it. On the next slide, uh, that is my condensed version of open source tools in the enterprise. I want to turn it over to Steve now, who's going to talk about using Kibana alongside your security platform. All right, so I'm running off my slides here, but I'll just say next slide uh, when we go on. But I'll start off on the uh, just the opening slide. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. I'm glad you mentioned Pi-hole. Uh, I think that's a, an easy thing to set up, and like it provides immense amount of value. So that's something that we play with a lot here at Logarithm also. Nice. Um, so yeah, so as Paul mentioned, I'm going to talk about using Kibana alongside your security platform. Paul talks a lot about it. Uh, these great open source projects that are out there. Um, some of you, you know, maybe not have the bandwidth to set that up, or you've already purchased something commercial such as Logarithm. But what we're going to go through is that doesn't mean that you can't still take advantage of a lot of the cool things that are available um, out there in the open source world. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, my name is Steve Kaufman. Paul did a great job of explaining what a technical product manager does or is supposed to do. Um, here at Logarithm, I work directly with the engineering teams that uh, work on our search and our storage layer, our persistence layer for that data. If we go on to the next slide and build out uh, the first bullet there. Yep, there you go. So, Kibana, why would one want to integrate with Kibana? One, it's open source. And it usually fits in really well with most backend databases. Um, ours, it works really well with because we do leverage uh, Elasticsearch for our live data persistence layer. And so as um, Paul was mentioning, a company called Elastic, they make what's called the ELK, ELK uh, stack, which is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. They've also come out with some new collection um, pieces, too, that's called uh, Elastic Beat which are really cool for collecting different data. But essentially, you can take your existing logarithm deployment and turn it into an ELK stack and get some additional benefit out of it. So if we go on to the next slide and build out the first bullet with the three sub-bullets, uh, we'll talk about why you'd want to do this. So some things is it's maybe already familiar tool. A lot of times when I talk to our customers, they already have operation teams that are using the ELK stack for collecting different things from DevOps to IT operations data. And there are, it's a tool they love. It's something they don't want to give up. Um, and, and they want that front end into their data. Uh, another thing, maybe they've already had some training along with this throughout their career. Uh, one of the really key things is I see a lot of overlap in what operation teams and what security teams are collecting in terms of data. And you find a lot that there's two different technology stacks that are collecting the same log, storing the same data, um, being used in conjuncture. So this gives you the ability, if possible, especially for some of the smaller um, industries out there, to not have, not spend the money on these two separate toolings to get the same functionality. If you build out one more time, um, some of the benefits, which you already showed some, is there's a lot of cool different custom visualization types that, you, that get exposed to Kibana. You build out again. Um, there's some really cool advan advanced mapping. So if you get some of that geographical location data in your logs, you can really start to get some insight on where traffic is originating from and where it's going to. And then if you build out one more time in, uh, I think it was Elasticsearch 5 and Kibana 5, is when they introduced something called Timeline. And it's, uh, it's a very advanced analytics uh, 
time analysis analytics platform that lets you do some really cool things in comparing data and actually doing some math against it. So if we go on to the next slide, which is uh, logarithm plus Kibana, I can just go through how you would integrate Kibana with a logarithm deployment. And this should look similar to other sims that are out there also. And I'll also go through an example later on on how you can connect this to SQL. Even if you don't have Elasticsearch as your persistence layer, you can still do some things with it. So this is an example of what a basic or a usual logarithm deployment looks like. We have things called agents that sit out there on your network, on your individual host that collect the different logs. Uh, it goes into our processing layer. This is a key benefit also of tapping into your existing SIM platform. Most SIM platforms have, have some sort of processing analytics to them. So it's actually taking the log, breaking it apart, adding the metadata instead of like IDs and putting it into their schema. So now you have enriched data that's just waiting to be tapped into. If you build it out one more time, um, essentially with Kibana, since it's made to work with Elasticsearch, uh, you just ex install Kibana on top of Elasticsearch. In this case, uh, we use it on Windows and, and Linux. This is an example of like a Linux cluster. Uh, for more information on this, please go out to the logarithm community. Uh, we have detailed instructions on how to configure this. So basically, Steve, logarithm uses Elasticsearch uh, in the back end and you can take a Kibana open source front end and just connect it there and use it as an additional analytics tool. Exactly, exactly. And uh, I'll, I'll maybe highlight some points here too since you bring that up. Um, this does bypass like all the role-based access controls maybe you have set up in mm -hmm. Logarithm. Um, so there's other tools though, open source tools. Uh, Elastic makes one called XPAC that has some of this. Uh, some is paid for, some is not, so you have to look at that. And then there's one more called SearchGuard that has open source again as you mentioned please read the licensing but you can set permissions up around this Kibana access for those of you that are concerned and many of you should be concerned uh, about access to the data because a sim is a big valuable um, location for a lot of PII information. Awesome. And then if you go on to the uh, next uh, slide I'll go through some demos. I'll go through two slides of like uh, basic demos with pictures and then if it will work, I'll try and do a live demonstration, but we'll do these first. Um, so if you build out the first one with the first picture, it's probably like three clicks, what you should be seeing is an operations example. And a lot of these are ones we've seen customers actually integrate with Logarithm. So again, this is data that's already in your Logarithm sim. You don't need to go figure out how to collect and parse it. You just have to tap in another uh, visualization point to it. So here is ma managing or looking at a uh, AWS, AWS infrastructure, total bandwidth in, out, how many instance counts you have. Um, you know, here you could see if maybe a developer overnight spun up a whole bunch more instances, it would easily pop up. You can also monitor inbound traffic and outbound traffic. Outbound is always interesting because that's where things start to get expensive. If you build out the next image, this is just a this is a high level report that was actually one of our customers I did. They just wanted to easily see where their log traffic was coming from. They had it classified as audit operations and security. And then if you build out it again, we're talking about network security and analytics. And go to the next picture. This one's really interesting. This one's actually using our network monitor, but other open source network monitors can give you the same this the same information. Uh, we do have an open source one also. It's called Net Netmon Freemium. But what we're looking at here is actually DNS usage. Uh, we look at bandwidth consumption. We look at latency um, of the network and the DNS server. We can compare that uh, between inbound and outbound traffic. And then we can actually monitor the DNS behavior in real time for uh, the number of them, the bytes, and the latency. And one thing that's really interesting here, this is a good way to find like data exfiltration. If you see a spike in this picture on the upper right-hand corner, there's a spike. This is something that a security analyst would be very interested in looking into what was happening during this time. And if we build out again uh, for business intelligence and web analytics and then build out one more picture, um, I love looking at Apache access logs when it comes to a lot of this type of stuff. It, you can make some really cool visualizations uh, just as you're trying to get used to using Kibana. But one thing, you can use it similar to like Google Analytics. If you've got different uh, web campaigns or stuff going on, you can actually see where traffic is coming from, where your different Apache web servers are getting hit from, where data is coming in, where data is leaving. 
you can really build some cool insights into what's happening on some of those machines. Then if we go to the next slide, it should be SOC metrics and reporting. So this is an example of using the full ELK stack, and we have this package up, you can download it from the logarithm community to monitor your SIM itself. So a lot of examples I just showed was using data that we're collecting from your network. This is using data that is generated from the SIM itself. So the SIM is doing a lot of work. It's creating alarms, it's creating events, it's processing logs. In our case, we have a, uh, we have a analyst tracking platform called CASE. And this is where if an analyst sees something interesting, they can go open up a case, they can have collaborators to that case. And this is where we really start collecting metrics on mean time to, detect, to detection and mean time to respond. So if you're a SOC manager, you can actually use some of this information to, to measure how your team is doing. And if the tools, Paul, you mentioned some tools don't provide that much value, this is where you can actually go monitor those tools you've purchased or that you've deployed and see if you can see trends of productivity or improvement or efficiencies inside of your organization, inside your organization. So if you want to, I'm gonna try and share my deployment and just show you how this uh, gets set up. Um, all right, so what we're looking at here is just the logarithm web console. So this is, this is a test deployment I have up and running. It's running logarithm. It has an Elasticsearch cluster in the back end that is storing data. And this is where, um, those of you that are familiar with Logarithm, you usually spend most of your days in the web console where most of the analyst functionality happens. But with the same data, I also have installed Kibana right next to my Elasticsearch. It's extremely easy. Again, I have documentation out there, but essentially all you do is install Kibana, point it at your index, and you will start seeing data. Um, nice. So this so is here, Kibana connected to, to Logarithm. I mean, you can connect Kibana to any solution that's using Elasticsearch, correct, Steve? Correct, okay. correct, and I'll have it, and I'll show after this uh, how you, even if you don't have Elasticsearch, you can still get some of that data. Nice. Um, but this is, this is right on top of Logarithm, so what we're looking at here, again, is uh, looking at some Apache access logs, um, but I did nothing, absolutely nothing, to get this data parsed so I could show it in Kibana other than installing Kibana. This is data that was collected through the Logarithm sim uh, processed by Logarithm Sim and then stored in our Elasticsearch cluster. And all I did uh, was I set this up, I made an index pattern. All of our indexes start with logs dash and then there'll be a date. So if you just do a logs dash star, you can even do just a log star um, and that will, that will find the indexes and populate your data. But I made a quick dashboard here, just leveraging some of that uh, Apache access logs. And some things you instantly get is you get origin location. You also get destination destination location if you're interested. And I've seen some plugins that actually like draw arrows with, with point indicators on which way traffic's going to different locations. I get like unique visits. Um, here's this uh, visits by different areas over time. So this can help you out with like different marketing campaigns if you're trying to target region, or this is also good from a security use case. If you see a, uh, abnorm an abnormal like burst somewhere and you want to go investigate it, if you're interested in the device types, that's easy information to pull out of there. This one's really cool for IT operations. Like if you're running a web server, you start, start getting some 404 errors, you can just easily go and overlap here and see like where that's hidden the server that you're getting those issues. So you can overlap data in some of this time series analysis. And then a lot of folks that manage Apache or any kind of web server likes to look at like data transfer just to see where you are in the throughput of your server to see if it's starting to get peaked out or if you see it starting to get flat at the top or something like that. Yeah, I like um, that, Steve, because, you know, uh, IT in, in operations can use that data for the overall health of the web server. And security can also use that data to look at anomalies like, you know, you're looking at the uh, amount of traffic that per host that might be coming at your server generating the most log entries. That could be mm -hmm. someone scanning your website or attempting some kind of attack or exfiltrating data from, you know, database and all that stuff. So that's, that's super useful. That's a good use case for, uh, for Kibana. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny whenever we do this, especially like with, um, you know, a real live web server, you always find something similar to like what you're just saying, where there's interesting, it's interesting traffic from a unlikely location mm. that results in something, a scan is extremely common. Um, 
Now, the next one that I kind of mentioned was, okay, this is looking at the data that's inside your logarithm deployment that you're collecting from outside sources. We also look at data that's created by the logarithm deployment itself. Um, so this is leveraging the, in, the full ELK stack. So this has, this is just a bundled, what we call the metrics app. Again, you can go download this from our website. Um, but it's using Logstash to make SQL queries, to pull SQL metrics into Elasticsearch, and then we're serving it up with uh, Kibana. So this is metrics on the logarithm deployment itself. So how many messages per second are we processing, uh, collecting and processed, and how many of those what we classify as an event, um, overall messages collected, so forth, so on. This one's kind of neat. If you have a larger deployment, uh, so we scale horizontally, uh, and you add more data processors to the deployment, you can make sure that they're load balancing correctly. Um, just based on how many messages they're collecting and processing per hour. And then in this, if you go check it out, and you can create all the number of dashboards you want on top of this, but we just have a few out of the gate for different things. I did mention that we have a case function in our product. This actually shows you like cases created by hour, what their priority is. Ideally, a real environment would have more information in it. This would be a tad bit more interesting. We can break out by type of case, uh, what their user is, and who's who's got them, so forth. And then here I was kind of talking about time to qualify and time to investigate. If this was a real de deployment, you should see some trends in these numbers where the minutes are going down. This is how you're going to start measuring value out of some of these uh, different things you are investing in and that you're using in your environment. Again, this is an example of tapping into metrics that Logarithm produces, but I mean, anything with a database out there, if there is a beat or some sort of log stash configuration to collect that. So even if you are kind of tied up around commercial software, it, you can get a lot of value out of some of these open source things to increase that value. And I mean, reach out to your vendor. Again, with us, we got it all on the community. But ask for ways how you can connect to this because um, it, it should be exposed and securely in a way that you can access it. And that's kind of the end of that demo, Paul. Sweet. If people have questions, feel free to type them in the chat and they will be relayed to me. Uh, you can continue, Steve. Yeah, and then, yeah, I was just, my next slide is um, just pointing people at our community. If you're not familiar with it, um, it not only covers logarithm questions, but it covers a lot of security type questions. So again, even if maybe you're not familiar with logarithm, but you have certain security use cases or questions around log collection or something like that, you can still find answers out there. And again, all this stuff that I just talked about is posted out there. And if you are a logarithm customer, there's detailed um, instructions on how to configure this. And I've, I'm on the community. I follow it. Uh, Steve Kaufman, there's a Wyoming Cowboys logo with my name. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out. Sweet. So you can go to logarithm.com forward slash resources. Uh, and as well as access the community, community.logrhythm.com. Uh, again, I apologize for our, our late starts due to some of our technical difficulties. Uh, if those in the audience have any questions uh, about any part of the um, presentation today, please feel free to type them uh, into the chat, and we will do our best to address them. I know we're a little past uh, the top of the hour. Uh, we did get started about 15 minutes late, um, but certainly, you know, if anyone has questions, uh, let me know. I see a couple of questions there that could be relayed to me. And uh, Steve, your um, you also have a free tool that you mentioned uh, briefly, which is Netmon Freemium. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So Netmon Premium is a, Netmon in general is a network monitoring tool. Um, and Netmon Premium is completely free. It's, it's surprisingly um, pretty full featured. And this is, you can stick it on your network. It's really cool to put it on your home network because you can see all the incoming outgoing traffic and you can really find out some interesting things that are happening on your network, especially if you have visitors or kids or something like that. So you can see what applications, what websites are visiting, what they're looking at, you can actually do packet capture and analysis um, with it. So you can you can capture some of that data and actually replay it live. Um, this is also a really cool kind of um, 
threat detection or uh, analysis tool in your SOC. So with some of the replay capability of these packets, you can actually go capture a packet, then replay it in a, in a secluded environment, just like on a laptop that's not connected to the network. So you can actually see um, potential threats happening without exposing it to a live environment. Um, so there's, there's a lot of cool things to play with there. And I'd, I'd kind of, you know, ask everybody, go, go, go get it, put it on your internal network. It doesn't take much resources. It runs on Linux. Uh, and you and it's all it's all self-contained, right, Steve? I just get the the Linux package, I dump it on a box, I mirror some traffic to it, and the web interface and analytics are already built in with the collection engine, right? Absolutely, absolutely. All righty. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so, when integrating Kibana with LogRhythm or any other commercial product, you lose the enterprise features such as AD integration and role-based access controls. How do you open up Kibana to the users while maintaining least privilege? Or yeah, that's a that's a great that's a great question. Um, I would go look at one. Uh, Elastic themselves have a tool set around that called XPack. They have a plugin for that. Mm -hmm. That is some of that is open source and and to limit of features, and then some I believe you have to pay for. I know they opened up some more of that with Elastic Search Sticks. Another thing to go look at is something called SearchGuard, which is also open source. Again, read your license agreement, but that has some of that permissions management. I know XPAC gets pretty cool where you can like set permissions all the way down to fields within a log itself. So you can actually segregate out what folks can see based on field types, not, not even down to like the log level itself. So you, you can get there, um, but you have to leverage some of those plugins, either by Elastic or other third parties. The next question is, could you monitor Windows services on Kibana or LogRhythm? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure which Windows services uh, you're interested in, but you absolutely can through both. So uh, you can, most of our Windows collection, you monitor those services. One example uh, that I didn't show there is um, I'm actually monitoring the services that we install. So we have several components within LogRhythm, so you can see them starting up, shutting down, um, if services heartbeat, you can capture whether or not they are heartbeating or missing a heartbeat. So yes, you absolutely can do that. Yeah, and the other thing we were talking about um, before, Steve, was if you had the OSSEC agent, that can be automatically, all the data that that agent collects can be sent to Elasticsearch and analyzed with Kibana. And the mm -hmm. use case I was presenting is, I mean, it could be used for security, right? But um, you know, if I were to deploy OSSEC agent on my Windows systems, and I had it report back CPU utilization, memory utilization, and disk space utilization, that can all be rendered in Kibana and you can monitor that, correct? Yep. That, that is absolutely correct. Um, one, thing, one thing there is, yep, you can just forward that straight to Kibana if you do, I mean, straight to Elastic if you do that. The SIM wouldn't be able to pick it up. You, right. If you wanted both to be able to pick it up, uh, you, I'm not sure if we have a processing rule for that, but that'd be a great one to put in as a request and we get turned out. You can also write your own processing rules in the logarithm sim, but yep. one way or another, you can definitely collect that. Yeah, and you can collect any Windows event, really, and analyze it with Kibana, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. yeah so we should have most of those just through logarithm, so that data should all be there for you. Right. Awesome. Um, the other... Oh, so does logarithm use Beats or their own proprietary monitoring tool? Uh, right now, we are we have our own tool for our agent, for our system monitor agent that is doing mm -hmm. the collection. Um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too much, but uh, Beats is something we're definitely looking at mm -hmm. uh, to leverage in with the logarithm sim. Yep. Awesome. Uh, the other question was someone has McAfee Nitro uh, and wants to use Kibana to work with that. I don't know what the back end is to McAfee's Nitro, if they're using Elasticsearch or something else. I am I am not sure either. Again, um, if you know what the database is there, uh, look up look up uh, either through Beats or Logstash on if somebody's already written a configuration to collect from that. I'm I'm sure somebody has. Uh, that's the other nice thing about all this open source stuff is there's usually somebody that has figured this out. Right. Um, I would I would check with McAfee to make sure that the right things are opened up or you know read mm -hmm. through documentation uh, in order to collect. But I'm yeah, sure so you way. said earlier, Steve, it, is, it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be Elasticsearch on the back end, right? There could be another database that you can connect Kibana yeah, so to. That, yep, so that, that second example I showed, I was collecting all that data from SQL. 
Um, so that okay. was just using Logstash to, mm. to make queries into SQL with the, what is it, the JBDC driver. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. I know I have that. Yep. And you said you can do flat files too. Like we were talking about if I had Apache logs and I just wanted to dump them out somewhere and then point Kibana and or Elasticsearch at the flat files, you can do that as well, right? Yep, you can do that either with the SIM or just with uh, Elastic itself. So with the logarithm SIM, we collect from flat files. That's how I did that demonstration I showed there. Mm. I have I have used and configured Elasticsearch Beats to do the exact same thing, though, um, and just forward it into an Elk stack. That's awesome. I learned a lot, actually, it, more from the questions than <laughs> I think. <laughs> That's awesome. Because well, we <laughs> went through the dry run before, so I had saw what you were going to present, but I thank our audience uh, first for your patience as we got started late today, and also uh, for the great questions. Um, you know, yeah, I learned yeah. a lot, and it's actually more powerful than uh, I had uncovered before. So, uh, you know, this was great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. Steve, thank you for participating today. It was awesome. Uh, I loved your content, and like I said, I learned a lot, especially from from the questions about some of the extended possibilities that I didn't even know existed, which is awesome. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Um, and again, you know, if you register for this webcast, you will get a copy of the recording um, and a copy of our slides as well. So, you know, if you want to go back and review any of the information in our slides uh, and or go back and watch certain sections um, of Steve's demo or any of uh, my slides as well, you'll have access to the video version. Um, so you can expect, expect those in email within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, so you'll have the materials for this webcast. Thank you again, everyone, for listening and watching. See you next time.